So as a quick introduction, uh, you are sitting within the private cloud management track. And this session will be focused on sharing more about the stack that VMware is putting together and a lot of the new products that were announced this morning in the keynote in regards to how VMware is starting to put products into the marketplace that we believe will serve as a foundation for us to enable you as a customer to build out a private cloud. As the title says, um, I will also be drawing some pretty direct comparisons in this session. And the reason for that is because as I've been traveling around as part of my job in product marketing, talking to a lot of customers such as yourselves, you know, there are a lot of questions coming up about cloud, about virtualization, and specifically about private cloud. And um, I, I will say, I, I hear a lot of things from the customers about, hey, uh, so-and-so says this, so-and-so says this. They, they do um, everything that VMware does at, at a fraction of the cost. And by the way, if you use us, you'll take two inches off your waistline. I mean, all right. I, I jest on that last part, but there is a little bit of that tone. And uh, my goal here is not to come in and, and bash someone else as well. But I know that in the state of where cloud computing is at, if you're sitting in this room, I'm assuming that you're kind of on that edge, right? If you're thinking about a private cloud, you've probably got a good percentage of your data center already virtualized. But it's still fairly new in the development cycle. And so uh, my assumption coming in is that you're planning to do your own evaluation to figure out for yourselves which offering really addresses your business needs. And so what I'm going to do, you know, I'll probably spend about the next 40 minutes or so and save some time for Q&A, is share with you what VMware stack looks like, what we believe our differentiation and where our advantages are, and then I'll let you go ahead and take those along with my side-by-side -side comparisons because I know you're going to go and do your own evaluations. So with that, let me go ahead and dive in. Standard disclaimer, I've gone ahead and broken out the agenda into three main sections. I think because it is so early on and there's a lot of talk about cloud computing, private clouds, I will spend a little bit of time up front level setting everyone about how I'm defining private cloud and why we see some of the benefits there. Then as we start looking into requirements, I'm going to propose a set of four high-level criteria uh, that we have found very helpful in our own product development to think through what's the final business value that you are looking for as you're considering a private cloud. And then I'll go ahead and map out our stack and how it maps to that business value. And then finally, at the end, you know, after I map that out, I'll highlight where we see our differentiation and our advantages. All right, so that, that's my plan for the next 40 minutes or so. So let's go ahead and dive into the first one. Right. Yes, you've all been hearing about the cloud. Right? It's another name. We've been hearing about it as utility computing, grid computing, a lot of different words. But I wanted to put this up here basically to paint the picture that it's not something unexpected. If we trace out what's been happening in the world of IT compute for, I'll say, the last 50 years or so, we have been steadily moving in this trend of greater and greater distributed computing. Right? And cloud's just a label that we slapped on to this next major tectonic shift. Now, it is significant from the standpoint that these don't just happen every year or so. Right? If, if, you, if you go with my framework here, I'm tracing it all the way back to mainframe days, you see this type of shift come up every 10, 15 years or so. But we do very much believe that we're on the cusp of one of these next shifts. Right? Why is this generating so much buzz? Because it does bring together this perfect storm in which the business and the line of business side is seeing value in regards to simplifying, um, increasing their agility, shortening the amount of time in which they can get resources that are required for them to adjust to changing business conditions. So that's one side of it. And on the other side, yeah, IT is looking at this and saying, gosh, there's more and more pressures coming upon me, and this is a good opportunity for me to deliver greater efficiencies, but at the same time still retaining the control I need Right, in order to deliver what's been asked. And so um, you've been hearing us talk about it as on the business side, it is a new way to consume IT as a service. And on the IT side, it's a new way to deliver IT as a service. So I'm calling it the perfect storm here. That's why there is all this uh, talk about cloud computing. Now, there has been a lot of discussion, and it seems to dominate around the public clouds. 
Now, VMware has uh, a lot of sessions around here. We painted our overall strategy. We do believe public clouds are an important part of it. But where we're at today, enterprises are asking a lot of questions, right? If, if cloud computing is only about public clouds, then the questions I hear are things such as, well, what do I do with my existing data centers? What do I do with my existing assets and applications? Do I have to rewrite my existing applications? Um, how is it that I'm able to meet the service requirements? I have questions about security and compliance. And that's just a quick overview of the type of questions that are coming up. And that's why I believe that people are starting to say, look, I, I, I understand the benefits of cloud computing, but I can't quite take everything out there to that private cloud, excuse me, to the public cloud. And that's where the concept of the private cloud comes in. Uh, that's just what VMware calls it. You know, there might be other terms that you've heard. And that's about taking the benefits of the cloud and how do we build an evolutionary path that leverages your existing data center, your existing assets, okay, in order to start getting some of these benefits. The other reason why we see private cloud as becoming more and more important is because um, our, our CEO, Paul, likes to say, public clouds enable your senior management to ask you some very unfair questions. And we'll admit it right up front. They are unfair, but given that they're the CXOs, they're able to ask them anyways. Right? They come in and say, hey, Amazon's published price list says X, Y, and Z. You know, four cents a minute per, uh, not a minute, excuse me, four cents for a server per hour. Um, what do we get? And you do all your math and you're like, oh gosh, we're not at four cents. All right. So is it an unfair question? Absolutely it is, because you're delivering something very different than what Amazon's delivering, but the question still gets asked. And that's the other thing we keep hearing back about why the interest on private cloud is growing. Okay. So an adapted version of what you saw in the keynote this morning. Therefore, if that's the picture of what's happening in the marketplace and the pressures that enterprises, and I believe many of you here are facing, right? Our approach is that through our vCloud strategy, we are working with service providers. Last count I saw was over 2,600 service providers working in the VMware vCloud initiative in order to build out these public clouds. But in parallel, we're delivering solutions where enterprises are able to start rolling out these public, uh, excuse me, these secure private clouds as well. Because ultimately what we want to do is have a common platform, have a common management layer and have common security that'll span across these, work within industry bodies so that the vision we've put out there about a secure private cloud where you have application mobility and application portability will happen. We're not there yet today. I'll, I'll be very upfront about that. But that is the vision. In fact, we laid this out two years ago at VMware 2008. And so it was pretty exciting that this morning when Steve Herod announced a lot of our new products, that was us starting to put the pieces in place with actual products that was delivering on what we talked about two years ago. All right. So if that was our vision, how do we now bring this back to how VMware is going to execute on it? Let me go ahead and start at the very bottom of, of, of my three-layer slide here. You know, at the infrastructure layer, you notice that we have vSphere, uh, our management products such as vCenter, our vShield security products that we just rolled out, and also include in there the vCloud service direct, excuse me, the vCloud director. See, I, I even got tripped up on our own names here. But the vCloud director, and we're using that as the common layer working with VMware-enabled public clouds, as well as for enterprises to build out their secure private clouds. And so it ends up being a common platform at the infrastructure layer. We believe it's important to have deep visibility down to that platform hypervisor virtualization layer, because essentially what this is doing is presenting the, the new hardware of the future. Right? It's that interface point, and so you need some pretty deep understanding of what's going on with the servers, the, the storage, the networking. And so because VMware does deliver vSphere, right, we can optimize to that. Now level up from there, as you take a look at the platforms, we've laid out a strategy uh, with Spring combined with our vFabric products and Hyperic, so that developers, as they develop on these new frameworks, can have the assurance of rolling it out not only on VMware-enabled private clouds, 
VMware-enabled public clouds, but also we realized there was going to be independent clouds out there that are not going to be built on VMware. And that's okay, right? Uh, we, we know we're not the only game in town, but we do want to appeal to developers so that they know, once I've spent the investment in it, I'm going to be able to run on a very, very broad ecosystem out there. Back a few months ago, we announced a partnership with Google, and that's actually one of our very first steps into this, you know, making sure that this common layer spans even if the service provider is not VMware-enabled. Okay. On the VMware-enabled ones, the best example I'll point to is our joint venture with Salesforce.com, where we've rolled out VMforce. So you see how we're really starting to put these pieces in place. Right? It's, not just, um, it's not just talk at this point. Okay. Uh, very top of the layer, I'm actually not going to spend any time in this particular session. There's plenty of others that go into greater detail about that third layer of the end user computing model. Okay. My next slide um, will represent my contrast of how we believe we're building out our overall strategy with what Microsoft is talking about out there. So when you hear about Microsoft talking about cloud right now, uh, the thing that comes most prevalent is Azure. Now, the thing to understand about Azure is that today it is focused on platform as a service, and it is focused on off-premises. Okay. And they absolutely have invested a lot into this, right? Um, a very, very significant company and, and the resources that they put in. But from our point of view, a lot of questions remain out there. Right? Um, our company is comfortable deploying it on today. Microsoft only run data centers. What do you do with existing applications to easily get them into this cloud? And once you do get them in, uh, how easy is it for you to actually get them out of that cloud? Uh, there's been talk about how it supports .NET, Java, Ruby, PHP, and other languages. And I, I can understand where they're going. Right? That sounds like the same message as we are. Um, the question I would just put out there is, time will tell how well they support non-.NET languages on Azure and whether it's really going to be a first class citizen or not. So I don't have all the answers to that either, but those are questions that we're seeing with this overall strategy. Now back in July there was an announcement in regards to the Azure platform appliance and that is being positioned as they'll have partners that can build up their own Azure clouds and it was also positioned as uh, very large enterprises could have kind of a, a big cargo truck pull up, drop an Azure appliance in a cargo container on premises, and Microsoft is able to host that as well. Okay. So there is this additional angle here in regards to getting not just having an off-premises play, but an on-premises play. But I, I still see questions here as well. Right? right now it's being positioned as predominantly for very, very large organizations. Right? The, the interviews are conducted, said the target market, the target customer, or companies that can buy 1,000 servers at a time. And um, still remains to be seen just hearing about the different timetables and details for exactly you know, how these platform appliances are going to play out. But now if you take a look at the infrastructure side, right, right now the key solution there is going to be a Hyper-V plus system center based solution. And from a private cloud perspective, we believe that that's not an adequate solution because it lacks some core capabilities that are necessary to, in, to achieve the high efficiencies and utilization that you're looking for in a cloud solution. Some of the biggest ones are uh, the inability to do logical and hierarchical resource pools on shared infrastructure. And what I mean by that, I'll explain a little bit more, but the short version is to get the high efficiencies, you can't afford to create a bunch of separate physical silos if that's the only way you can enforce your security and also protect yourself from the noisy neighbor effect. Because right? on shared infrastructure, it's critically important that you have a way to isolate and guarantee resource SLAs as well as isolation at the network level. Now, when they go to off-premises, they have been out there talking about how thousands of partners have deployed on Hyper-V, but it appears to us that they've just taken the same issues I just described on the on-premises side and now shifted that over to the partners. And so in many cases now, the partners are trying to figure out, how do I really automate this process? Because they don't have a capability like VMware DRS where you can create the logical pools in an automated fashion. And again, we'll talk about that a little bit more. And finally, kind of the thing that I would pose out there is there's been a lot of claims about how all these different parts are going to tie together. Okay? 
Maybe it'll happen. Sounds great, but I haven't seen a lot of details on that. So these are the questions that uh, we see and we believe need to be answered in order to really deliver a compelling overall private cloud strategy. Now, I said that in the second part of the uh, uh, session, I was going to start laying out some of the criteria that drove our own product definitions and our approach to how to do cloud computing. And so I've got up here uh, three high-level categories of capabilities and characteristics that we think are critically important. Number one, right, you're going to cloud because you're trying to lower your costs. And that's what I mean by very high efficiencies. And we believe the only way to do that is by having highly elastic pools, multi-tenant, a multi-tenant um, design that runs on shared infrastructure. Okay? Because what got us, what got all the cost savings from virtualization in the first place was by breaking down silos on physical servers. And now what you don't want to do is create new silos of pools of physical virtualized hosts. And the second part is the automation component to it. My high-level category number two is giving IT departments levels of agility and control that they just did not have before. Subcomponents under here are presenting uh, self-service in regards to uh, end-user portals as well as self-service catalogs. And on the control side, really building in core capabilities like security and availability directly into the, <clears throat> excuse me, into the platform. Take a quick drink of water here. And finally, the third high-level category that uh, drove a lot of our decisions was this concept of freedom of choice, where at the end of the day, you want the reassurance of knowing that the solution you've picked is open, interoperable, uh, by the fact that they're adhering to standards and also working with industry standards bodies uh, so that, um, that that whole entire vision of the secure hybrid cloud can really become a reality. And the final portion under freedom of choice is this leveraging existing investments. Because unless um, you happen to be part of some new startup that has no existing investments in the data center, right, it's just really not practical for you to say, I'm just going to make the complete jump to an external public cloud, and we're just going to kind of write off what we've currently got. So we believe this is a critical part of it. You oftentimes hear us refer to this as an evolutionary path. And, and the, the interesting thing about all this talk about cloud computing, uh, just expand a little bit more on this evolutionary path, is it's not going to be one of those things where suddenly you wake up one morning and you're like, oh, hey, I'm in the cloud, right? which is sometimes the way it comes across if you read the media. right? Everyone's going to the cloud. Okay? We believe that it's actually part of an overall journey. All right, this journey that we've been talking about that it started with virtualization, but ultimately is going to end in this overall concept of delivering IT as a service. And so the good news here is that you know, if, if you started with virtualization, the investment that you put in, you know, regardless of where you're at on this path, you could be on stage one, you could be on stage three, you could be anywhere in between. We believe and we want to deliver a solution that enables you to leverage that as you're working your way towards IT as a service. So I'm going to use those three high-level categories to establish this criteria that I talked about. And I won't spend a lot of time on this fourth one, but, but it bears mentioning. Because we see cloud computing as one of those major shifts that happen every 10, 15 years, right? it is pretty significant here. And so um, we do believe that it's important that you evaluate who it is that you're partnering with. And so that's really my fourth point there. So let's go ahead and dive into my top three points, more about the characteristics and the capabilities. Demonstrate what VMware Stack looks like and do our best job to map back to how we believe we're meeting those business requirements. So today's stack, VMware Stack today, is comprised of these four main components. It is vSphere 4 as our main foundation, our main platform. It's the vCloud director that provides some critical management capabilities, and I'll share about that uh, on the very next slide. It's about pay-per-use. And so the most recent version of our vCenter chargeback product integrates well with this overall stack. 
And then finally, we believe security fundamentally needs to change because if you're going to have logical pools and assign them to end users, you can't just create your security at the physical boundaries. And that's where vShield comes in. So vCloud Director. Um, two key new concepts I want to point out here. You've heard this morning, and I'm going to assume some of you may have also gone to some vCloud specific sessions, but really something new that, that we're introducing here is, is, is that virtual data center. Because if you think about um, how you get the efficiencies, how you scale in a cloud model without getting buried in the complexity of having to manage hundreds or thousands of individual servers or virtual machines, and also combine it with the ability to allow your end users or, or your tenants or your clients to do self-center, uh, self-service, excuse me, you've got to have a new construct. And that's what our, our virtual data center is called. I, I wish we could find a better name for it because uh, it, it can come across as a little generic, okay? But so far, that's what we've got. And so what you can do here is, as a provider, Right? to your internal constituents, you can set up a couple of different virtual centers, each delivering a different SLA. Right? You spend all this money on your very high-end SAN with all the spindles and all the redundancy, and you're probably going to put that in your gold tier, and you're going to charge a little bit more because it delivers a higher level of service, and, and frankly, your costs are higher as well. Okay, or you could create a silver tier or a bronze tier or whatever tier you want, and then from the user standpoint up top, we give you the capability to create what's called organizational VDCs, virtual data centers, that sit on top of these different resource levels. And from an end user standpoint, when they come in, they think they have their own dedicated data center. They have no idea that there's a shared infrastructure underneath, because that's frankly up to you to decide. And in Steve's talk this morning, he said, with that virtual data center, it could even be mapping out to something that's off-premises, but that, that, that's not the user's concern. You don't want them to have to worry about that. That's under your control, and we believe it was critical to add this new construct, because that's what's going to achieve the efficiency while giving you the control that you need. The other critical part, uh, new part, of, of the uh, vCloud director are these end user self-service portals as well as the catalogs so that every organization can get their own catalog. Right? Finance is going to require a different self-service catalog than sales. So you need that level of customizability. And here on this slide, I also call out security. I'll cover that in a couple of slides here. vSphere. Right? Why do I even bring up and mention vSphere? Uh, many of you have probably been longtime vSphere users. But the reason I'm, I'm mentioning it here is the VDC sounds great, but what makes it happen? What actually enables it? Well, it's core underlying capabilities of vSphere that allow us to create these VDCs. A couple that I'll just point to. Right? Uh, there are capabilities we deliver in the 4.0 release and even earlier. I'll just highlight some key capabilities in 4.1 and why they're important. So the first one I'll, I'll highlight is our VMware DRS capability. DRS is what allows us to create logical, hierarchical resource pools. So a, a lot of words, what do I mean by that? That just simply means I take a big physical cluster of servers, storage, and networking, and I'm able to carve it up so that I give a portion of it to finance, a portion of it to sales, a portion of it to HR. And those pools don't have to follow along the physical boundaries of physical servers, right? I could give 90% of this cluster to one team and 10% to another, or any combination you wish. And DRS will balance, do the dynamic load balancing underneath to make sure we deliver on that SLA. Okay, so that's a vSphere capability that makes VDCs possible. In 4.1, we also added technologies such as storage I.O. control, as well as network I.O. control. Uh, that's to address the whole you know, noisy neighbor or the, the, um, the resource hog neighbor. Right? One that's going to say, hey, I'm just going to consume all the storage I.O., all the network I.O., because they don't know that they've got another neighbor next door. So you, as the IT administrator, we're giving you a level of control that didn't exist before to be able to prevent that from happening, preventing the noisy neighbor from happening. 
So two quick examples, but they're to illustrate why vSphere is an important part of our stack, because you're leveraging some of those core capabilities to make VDCs a reality. In regards to vShield Edge, um, there's a couple of things here. The, the, the biggest one I'll highlight is that on this picture, I've, I've called it tenant A and tenant B, but those are basically you know, the, the same concept as those VDCs that I just talked about. Right? You're on shared infrastructure, but you're going to carve out a logical part of it, present it to a tenant, and say, hey, this is like you've got your own, own data center on your, uh, your, your, your very own data center. And so you've got to now be able to do basic security at the logical boundaries. You can't afford to just place them at the physical boundaries, or else this whole ent entire model breaks. So in addition to taking those security capabilities and putting them in a virtual appliance that can now sit within your virtual data center, your, your VDC, We've also integrated in a few other capabilities, such as um, some, some, some load balancer capabilities, as well as VPN, so that you can get rid of some of the physical boxes that you currently deploy at your physical boundary. And so that also helps to reduce some of the cost and complexity that exists. So it, it is a brand new product. would encourage you to uh, sit in and check out, on, uh, check out some more of our vShield sessions. But that's how it fits into our overall private cloud strategy. And finally, when we're talking about chargeback, right, in the cloud, we do believe it's critically enabled to give your uh, clients, your, your, your end constituents, the ability to pay as they go. But with vCenter Chargeback, we realize that there's a lot of different companies and, and cost models out there. And so one of our key design requirements was you can either select that a certain VDC is based on fixed allocation, meaning, OK, I'm going to charge a set price for the number of servers. And maybe that's appropriate for some business units. Go ahead and create them a VDC, put them on a fixed allocation. Others, though, you may say, you know what, I really want to transition them over to a utilization based. I'm going to measure their compute. I'm going to measure their networking, their storage consumption, their memory consumption, or whatever it might be. So you're able to do that. And Chargeback also gives you the ability to create hybrid models as well. Okay. And then finally, we build in some pretty robust reporting capabilities so that you can get a clear statement, both for yourself as well as your end user at the end of the day, so they know why they're getting charged, uh, what they're getting charged. So. I've covered a really quick overview on what makes up the VMware stack. And now I'd like to map it back to those high-level criteria that I established earlier. So with number one, which is the high efficiency through high utilization and automation, right, I've already covered how this new concept of the VDC we believe is critical to deliver on this business requirement. Because if you can't get to this multi-tenant model in an automated fashion, running on shared infrastructure, right, you end up back in the situation you had before, where you can have a lot of idle hardware sitting around. And so VDCs are, are, are critical, are, are, are a cornerstone of how we're going to look to enable this high efficiency. And here on this slide with the vSphere components, I put it there because VDCs are are, are, we can create them only because of the underlying enabling technologies that vSphere delivers. In regards to the agility with control, first, I'll bring up security. Right? It's this whole premise of being able to move from the physical boundary to the logical boundary. With vCloud Director, I pointed out earlier how there is a self-service portal, as well as this service catalog, where you can create a different catalog for every tenant, every, every um, uh, end user group, every business unit. And finally, uh, the third component here is on the chargeback side, because you've got to have a way to, if you, even if you're not charging back, to show back to your end users, your line of business, how much it is that they're consuming. And we believe that's a critical part of this whole new cloud model. And then in regards to this last vector of freedom of choice, you know, Steve earlier this morning had talked about how the OVF standard that VMware is actively participating in and that our products absolutely support is now uh, an, an, an ANSI, an ANSI standard. Our vCloud API is working its way through the distributed management task force. And our APIs in regards to the vSphere level with vCenter, uh, vStorage, vMSafe, um, 
the, the best evidence of how they're open and uh, actively being used is the uh, 230, 250 some odd uh, vendors on the solution exchange floor because they're able to leverage a lot of these APIs to deliver continued innovation. So those are just some of the ways that we're working to ensure this, this freedom of choice. Um, a final point that I'll just mention here is going back to this strategy of delivering a common platform, common management, and common security, right? That's what's going to allow you so that whether you've deployed it internally on your enterprise private cloud or you decide that you're going to set up something and route part of your workloads to a uh, external provider. Uh, you, you saw uh, Steve's uh, demo this morning showing how he was pushing something out to a Verizon public cloud. You want to still maintain that same management, same uh, administration tools. Okay? So we believe that's critical to fulfill this last vector of freedom of choice. Now, um, I've already brought up some areas in which we believe we have differentiation and advantages over what Microsoft's stack today delivers. So on that efficiency of choice, you know, we believe the key thing that's lacking there is that inability to create those logical resource pools. If you can't do that, then what happens is in order to deliver right, the uh, resource SLAs or to somehow automate that separation of the network, you're going to have to create physical silos because that's where your firewall physical appliance is going to have to sit. And with a new product they had introduced called the uh, Virtual Machine Manager Self-Service Portal, that sits on top of Virtual Machine Manager. It provides some new self-service capabilities, but it doesn't fundamentally address this, this underlying gap in regards to the logical resource pools in addition to some of the quality of service controls that I talked about of the storage and the networking I.O., um, in addition to the distributed virtual switch to make the management easier. And so th there are others down there, but the biggest one I would point to is this lack of the logical resource pools. Okay? We believe that they're fundamentally going to have to address that in order to achieve the efficiencies that we're hearing back from our customers. In regards to the second category of agility with control, Right now, uh, what we've delivered with the VShield product of being able to move the security from the physical to the logical boundaries that doesn't currently exist in their stack. The self-service portal does give you a self-service end-user portal as well as a service catalog, but I'll expand upon this in a little bit further, right? I mean, the requests might come in as self-service, but the key to get these, the, the, the automation and the agility is what happens after that request comes in. And finally, with the combination of Virtual Machine Manager and Operations Manager, again, there are some capabilities in regards to some of this chargeback, but when we've looked at it, we don't believe it's as robust in regards to its customizability and giving you the flexibility to charge in a broad set of ways. In regards to freedom of choice, um, the technologies that we see right now, we believe that it's more slanted towards Microsoft-centric technologies, whether it's Windows or .NET. And, and if you're a Microsoft shop, that, that can work for you. Uh, other customers we've talked to, uh, that's an open question for them about whether that's the path they want to go down. So, I mean, I've been talking a lot about pools here and logical boundaries there and, and this and that. I wanted to put together a, a little bit more of a customer scenario to try to see if I can draw out where we see our differentiation a little bit more. Let's go ahead and take what we see as the VMware experience. Uh, here I've got finance and sales, but you can imagine more than just two groups, uh, five groups, ten groups, however many people you need to serve within your enterprise. Uh, all of them, at some point within a given hour, are starting to send requests into IT. Okay? So they're going to they're, they're put in a, a request for infrastructure, and that ends up going to the VMware end user portal. So what happens after this? Right? This is really where the key comes in. Because the administrator right, is able to get out there and establish these virtual data centers ahead of time, running on shared storage, right? These VDCs can actually be spun up automatically because the IT administrator has already looked ahead of time and done his capacity planning to say, okay, this is how much capacity I believe I'll need, and as long as the requirements come in and they fit within these capacities, I'll automatically spin up the VDC and present it back to the end user. 
Okay? So work still has to be done. Don't get me wrong. There's nothing magical here, but that work can be done ahead of time, and it can be done on shared infrastructure so you're not having to create so many silos, each with a lot of idle headroom, because you, you, you aren't able to distribute your load across a wider base. Because right? if you think about it, that's really what got us into the uh, server virtualization, server sprawl in the first place, right? Everyone was building a lot of headroom in into isolated pockets of resources. Back then, the isolated pocket was a single server. We really don't want to go back to now creating a new pocket, which is a cluster of virtualization hosts. You've got to be able to share that. That's where we believe the efficiencies are going to take place. So this is what we're talking about when we're saying, you know, we're enabling a multi-tenant, an automated multi-tenancy model on shared infrastructure, because we believe it's critical to get that quick automation and reduce a lot of the steps that would manually have to be done if you don't have this model. Okay. If we paint out the exact same scenario on what's currently being offered on the Microsoft stack, the front end looks the same. Okay. Uh, you got all your business units all submitting their requests in, and it goes into the Microsoft end user portal. But what happens underneath that is different. Okay. What we see there is if you're not able to create the logical pools that make it easy to run on shared infrastructure, you have one of two choices. You can either create a lot of different silos of physical clusters ahead of time, because that ends up being your only way to protect from the noisy neighbor or predetermine your network isolation. Okay. Or the other option is you can wait for the request to come in and then the IT administrator can manually go figure out how many resources are necessary and then go ahead and spin it up afterwards. Okay. Either way, we see that you either end up with a longer SLA in order to deliver on that initial request, or you end up with a lot more idle hardware sitting around, therefore uh, diminishing those efficiencies that you're looking for. And as we were kind of digging into these products, I just you know, flash up a quick um, uh, screenshot from the documentation from that self-service portal. I kind of points out that as every request comes in, the expectation is that that IT administrator for every request is manually checking for resource availability and capacity, manually configuring those resources, and then manually doing that allocation. So I, I know I'm a little biased here, but I'll just present this anyways, right? We believe that if we sum up what I just covered, you know, we see vSphere and vCenter as the best virtualization for the clouds because it delivers core capabilities at that cluster level, at that pool level. With vShield Edge, we believe we're fundamentally changing the way security is done in a pooled model, in a cloud model. With Chargeback, our most recent version, we believe there's high customizability here, the flexibility that's necessary in order for you to really deliver and show end users what they're paying for. And finally, with vCloud Director that was just released this morning, that's what pieces it all together and delivers this new construct of a virtual data center that we see as key to achieving the business requirements for a private cloud. Let me go back here. And so that's a summary of where we see our differentiation with the cloud stack that was just announced today. Right? But for us, this really is just the beginning. Right? Even though it's starting to hit upon some of the core capabilities, right? you're going to see us continue to innovate this. But we do see the products that were launched today as a very significant step for us in regards to putting some real meat to this vision. Right? A lot of talk about vision out there. Our goal was to come in and put some meat behind it. And finally, this last slide here I mentioned before about how uh, we do see that it's important for you to choose a vendor that at the end of the day you believe is proven, is delivering a complete solution, and overall is providing you an evolutionary path so that you're not having to somehow uh, disregard your existing investments in infrastructure applications as well as whatever application development framework you're most comfortable with. Okay? I, I won't belabor the point by reading you these marketing slides here, these marketing points. So in conclusion, you know, we believe that with the products that are announced today, we are taking a very significant step forward to really start delivering products you can use on this path to building out a private cloud. Um, if you're newer to VMware, 
or if you're very familiar with us, I'll just end with a couple of different recommendations here. Right? For those who are new, right, um, maybe you came into this session because you're hearing all this buzz about private cloud, but you're not really thinking about implementing at this time. But this is still great information and context for you to have because we believe that wherever you're at in this virtualization road, right, it's going to, we're, VMware is putting together an overall plan so that you can build on top of that. So I would encourage you to evaluate where you're at in this overall journey to the cloud and find out how VMware can help you regardless of whether you're at stage one, two, or three. Come by the VMware booth this week. Or another great thing, if you're starting to get familiar with our vSphere products, is we have online something called a purchase, a vSphere purchase advisor. And you can input in what you're looking for, what your business requires, and we'll go ahead and provide you a recommendation on what vSphere edition we believe meets those needs best. If you're more familiar with VMware and you're sitting here like, look, I got you guys, I, I'm 60% virtualized, um, I really am really for the private cloud, then my recommendation would be definitely stop by the VMware booth if you have not, because I, I, I just did a high-level flyby of you know, uh, vCloud Director, a uh, vShield Edge, and I understand these are some pretty brand new products and pretty brand new concepts. So that's why we want to make sure that both products are represented in our booth. You could talk to the product marketing managers, you could talk to the product managers to actually build those requirements, and they'd be a great resource for you to be able to understand what these are about. Um, there, there are, of course, a lot of other sessions that are going on right now as well, and so uh, another great resource for you. So um, that, that, that brings me to the end of my session. Uh, I, I will open it up for Q&A. And if you would, please, either step up to the microphone or um, that's probably the preferred route, but go ahead and pop up your hand. I'll repeat your question for the recording. Or if there aren't any questions, I'll make sure to stay up here and answer any questions as well afterwards privately. So uh, thank you so much for coming into the session, and have a great rest of EM world.